and welcome back to U.S. History with Mr. Snyder. Today we're going to begin discussing Chapter 7, Issues of the Gilded Age, and one of those was racism and segregation and different social tensions that were going on. So let's go ahead and get started with Section 1. Your learning targets. Uh, we will assess how the whites in the South created a segregated society and how African Americans responded. We will analyze efforts of the whites to limit immigration and its effects. And we'll compare the situations of Mexican Americans and women uh, to those of whites. So let's go ahead and get started. So when Reconstruction ends in 1877, President Hayes removed all of the troops that were occupying the South. And that means that states were now allowed to reassert their racist control over newly freed blacks. And they tried to disenfranchise them, which means to take away their voting rights. And they also passed the Jim Crow laws. And Jim Crow laws are laws that kept blacks and whites segregated. I'll go over some examples here in a second. And the term Jim Crow actually comes from an early caricature performed by a white actor in blackface in the 1830s. And blackface would be, they would just paint their face black, um, very, very crudely, very racist, very um, insulting. But that is how they would portray black actors because they wouldn't allow blacks to act because they were segregated. So some examples of disenfranchising in Jim Crow since the 15th Amendment allowed blacks the right to vote, the southern states tried to get around that. They passed restrictive measures, like these three uh, examples of Jim Crow. The poll tax, which required voters to pay a fee, usually just a dollar or two, but blacks cannot afford that. Back then, you know, they barely have jobs sharecropping, so they can't afford to vote. That's one way to stop them. Literacy tests were tests to make sure a voter could read. Oh, well, you got to be able to read if you're going to vote. Um, most blacks back then did not have an education yet, and so that disqualified many blacks as voters. But even if they do did have those two, um, the grandfather clauses uh, allowed someone to vote as long as their ancestors had voted prior to 1868. And prior to 1868, they would have been slaves and so they would not be able to vote because they were related to slaves prior to 1868. And so because of these three things, black participation that had been gained during Reconstruction drops off dramatically. And Jim Crow in practice in the South, um, we begin segregating everything. Railroad cars, waiting stations, jury boxes, even black and white Bibles, cemeteries. Even when you're dead, you didn't want to be married or um, ne buried next to a black person. Uh, restaurants, parks, beaches, hospitals, you name it, it was separated. And so this issue comes to a forefront in 1896 when finally uh, the case of Plessy versus Ferguson, and this is a very, very, very important case. You're going to have to know Plessy versus Ferguson. This upholds the constitutionality of Jim Crow laws because a man, Plessy, who he gets on a train in Louisiana and they had segregated train cars and Plessy looks white I believe he is 75% um, white but he is a fourth black which means that he is black he has black blood in him and so they did not um, but he looks white so they let him on the car he bought a ticket he sat down he then stood up and said, I am actually black, and he was arrested. And this was actually a, um, a stunt in order to test this law. And they take it all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court says, as long as facilities are separate but equal, they did not violate the 14th Amendment. So they're allowed to be separated as long as they are equal. And in reality, these facilities were not very equal, but that's the way it was. They allowed it, and they said it was okay to have separate facilities for blacks and whites as long as those were equal, and that's called the separate but equal doctrine. And there's more about the case in, on page 192 of your textbook. So how do blacks fight back against this segregation? Well, 
they begin to adjust to it. They establish all black newspapers, all black schools and colleges, fraternal organizations for men, women's clubs, and black political associations. But there were two outspoken leaders. Um, Booker T. Washington, he is a man who advocated that, look, that whites are never going to like us, they're never going to accept us. We need to just basically accommodate ourselves to segregation. And he said that they should essentially uh, get a vocational education or an industrial education to blacks. So Booker T. Washington founds the Tuskegee Institute. Um, and that's where blacks could go and learn a trade, you know, not necessarily um, academic education, but how to do a skill in order to make a living. And Ida B. Wells is another lady who wrote articles uh, condemning the treatment of blacks um, and criticizing lynching in the South. And lynching was a form of hanging, kind of like uh, hanging on the spot, you know, not really planning being hanged, but dragging a black out of their house and hanging them from the nearest tree just because they were black. That is the way that um, a lot of times they wouldn't get in trouble for it. They would get a slap on the wrist, a night in jail or so, but um, we wanted to criticize that. Webb Dubois disagrees, or Webb Du Bois, I believe both pronunciations are acceptable. Also, W-E-B Du Bois. He criticizes Washington's willingness to accommodate to this uh, pattern of segregation, and he argues that blacks should not settle for anything but full and immediate equality. And also, they shouldn't limit themselves to just a vocational education. Webb Du Bois goes and gets his PhD from Harvard, one of the best schools in the country. He also didn't feel that um, the right to vote was something that blacks needed to earn. It was something that is their right. They shouldn't have to earn it by going through poll taxes and grandfather clauses and literacy tests. Moving on to learning target two, the Chinese um, were actually attacked because a lot of whites thought that they were taking away jobs. And of course, a lot of this happens in California where there's a very big Asian population. But uh, Congress responds to this by passing the Chinese Exclusion Act. They say for Chinese's own protection, they shouldn't be here. And so that prevents Chinese laborers from entering the country. And how, does the, uh, how do the Chinese immigrants respond? They take the issue to the Supreme Court. And the court does uphold the Chinese Exclusion Act and other discriminatory measures towards the Chinese. But they do state that um, Chinese people born here of Chinese descent cannot be stripped of their U.S. citizenship. So there's a small victory, but otherwise we are still going to discriminate against the Chinese. Mexican Americans um, who lived in Mexico or the areas of like Arizona, New Mexico, uh, Nevada, California, all that where that we got from the Mexican American War they were guaranteed property rights and they were still allowed to stay there. But anyway, the Americans come in and ask, okay, how can you prove your ownership of this land? And they couldn't. They didn't have a very good land ownership or deed system in Mexico at that time. So they lost their land. And in the late 1880s, a group called Las Goras Blancas fights back. And they engage in guerrilla warfare against the railroads out west and large ranches. So they would um, stage attacks and then disappear. Um, the guerrilla warfare. And they're actually supported by the Knights of Labor and their nickname means the White Caps. Las Goras Blancas. And lastly, women um, continue for to fight for the right to three things. Vote, to own property, and to get an education. On the state level, they are starting to get the right to vote. Uh, Wyoming becomes the first state to grant women the right to vote in 1869. Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, remember them, they begin the National Woman's Suffrage Association. And they fight for the constitutional amendment that is going to grant women the right to vote. And they kind of feel betrayed uh, that the 15th Amendment gave blacks the right to vote, but not women. So they're kind of, I don't know if jealous is the right word, but they're offended that blacks were given the right to vote, but not women. During this time, uh, the number of women attending colleges skyrockets. 
uh, one third of all college students are women in 1900 and today I believe it's over 50 percent are women who attend college and so women have come a long way in the 1880s and 1890s but they still have a long way to go um, but that is our lesson for today I hope you enjoyed it and I will see you later good night